Not a matter of if, but when crisis will rock your world. I'm Rashini Rajkumar, licensed attorney, crisis strategist, and host of The Crisis Files. In each case file, we explore a real world crisis. My crisis squad and I seek solutions. Today, we explore the quiet and very large issue looming in your house or the house of a loved one. Amy Olson is here to investigate. She's founder of Life Done Simply and a well-known productivity coach. No matter how organized we are, someone else's clutter can stop us cold. Amy is here to lend a hand in the case file I call death cleaning. Amy, since Margareta Magnusson's book, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, came out in 2018, this idea that sounds pretty scary is gaining popularity. It even spawned a reality TV series. What is death cleaning? Yeah, so Swedish death cleaning is a Scandinavian decluttering concept that's targeted towards those who are about 60, 65 plus. And it's where you work on eliminating all the unnecessary items from your home that you've accumulated throughout your lifetime. And with the sole intent that your loved ones won't be burdened with it after you've gone. All right, but I can see how you don't have to be 60 or an older for this to really apply to your life and your family's life. Yeah, you know, I think I I love the book and I love the concept. And I think my family or my grandparents being Scandinavian, they, this was kind of something they did. We We had the idea... And we're talking about items long before they passed. However, we were granted a long life with them and not everyone is. So though the Scandinavian concept is nice, we know that not all of us are granted a life to 65 plus. And so there's some benefits uh, from the concepts, um, but there's also some things that we can do a little differently to make sure that we're being even more proactive than Swedish death cleaning. Okay, so let's get into that because I'm all about productivity and we want to prevent crises of clutter in our listeners' lives. So what's step number one in this whole decluttering? Yeah, to set an intention. And I'm going to tell you, death is not a compelling intention. I know this from working with a lot of empty nesters. Yes, we all know death is inevitable, but it always seems off into the distance. And even, I will say, even when people are in in assisted living, you always think you have more time than you do. So what I tell people is you need to come up with an intention that is completely aside from death. It could be a financial goal, selling the house, um, paying for retirement. It could be a life goal, something like making space for something new, travel, maybe um, a physical goal. Um, A lot of people want to age in place, but it can be really difficult to age in place when you have 40 years of accumulation in a house. Um, And it can be emotional goals, maybe healing from the past, healing from the death of a loved one. Um, But it's really key to set an intention, like I said, that is separate from death Um, because it makes it more here, like it's here and now, and something that is positive versus something that is actually pretty negative. All right, let's use some real world examples. I'll start with myself. So near the end of 2021, my brother and I lost our mother. It was kind of unexpected. She wasn't super young or super healthy, but very, you know, not super unhealthy either, and just still very unexpected. So there was a lot left unsaid, a lot left unasked. And I really ended up with most of the duty of clearing out her home. And as we were clearing, giving things away, donating, keeping some things, it just dawned on me, I wish I had had conversations about these items with my mother sooner. So what are some ways we can now with our living relatives, no matter what their age, have these conversations? Yeah, a lot of people are afraid to have the conversation because there might be some family conflict. Um, There might be some money problems. There might be some things that... um, families hiding from one another. So these are all real scenarios. But I think what really trips up most people is they think they have to talk about every item. They have to cover 
the entire home, the, the garage, everything. And that simply isn't the case. I recommend that the empty nesters who are generally doing this sit down and have a dialogue with family, but not about everything. I want them to ask two questions. Actually, they're just asking one and they're answering another one, but is to ask their family members, their next of kin, whoever they think that they'd like to bestow some things to, is to ask them, what do you value the most here? And I came up with this question for my clients because through talking to a lot, I was seeing that next of kin felt very differently about items in the home than the parents. And it wasn't that they didn't want items from their parents or, or their grandparents or their aunts and uncles, but it was what they valued, what where their memories lied in, in that home were vastly different than where grandma thought or where mom thought. So asking that question, what do you value the most? And it starts that dialogue about, I mean, you'd be surprised what what your next of kin actually, where they find their value, where they find uh, the memory. But the second thing is to listen, take that information in, don't be offended, and then express to you what you value the most. With an important caveat that not everything can be important, right? If everything's important, nothing's important. So really think about curating in your mind what is the most important items in your home and then let the conversation evolve from there, from what they value and what you value and everything else is just stuff. Amy, I love hearing your expertise on this, especially that question that you ask your loved ones, what do you value the most? And really leave it open-ended. And it reminds me of the story of as we were clearing out my mother's home, and we had made the decision to do a major remodel on it and eventually move into it. And I have two stepdaughters, and I asked them, you know, what do you want? They don't live in the same city that we do. So some of these conversations were by phone. Some of them were, were when they were in town. And one of them sort of helped us start clearing out the kitchen. And in that process, she took what she wanted. I said, take what you want. I'm not a cook. You take what you want. But the younger one made a specific request when I asked that open-ended question for these cute, this in the powder room on the main floor, the faucet are these little dolphins and the towel rack is a rack with these little dolphin hooks that attach to the wall. And they're really old and I want to say they're brass. And she said, well, if you don't want those and they're not going to be used in the remodel, I would love those. And I thought, you know what? They completely are not going to work with the new style of the home. But that was one of my, if not my favorite thing in that home that I had lived in during high school and visited for, you know, decades afterward. And it made it, it was so special that she wanted that. So when she does put it up in a future home of hers, it's like my mother lives on. So I think it's really yeah. just neat that you mentioned that, that we have these, you know, that was just a bonding moment for us, that that's what she wanted. And then uh, when it came around to that was getting removed by the construction people, I said, please save that safely. And for her 25th birthday, we were able to send that to her. And she had kind of forgotten that she had asked for that. So it was really kind of a fun uh, box for her to open, right? So you can, yeah. it, it, in this whole title, Death Cleaning, it seems so somber and cold and callous, but we can really have some joyous moments doing this work. Yeah, I love that story. And so often I hear clients say, well, they don't want anything. And, the, and the, there's the somberness to it that we've held on to these things. And oh, the, so this younger generation, they just don't want anything. And what do we do? And I don't think it's that they don't want anything. It's just we value different things and our memories lie in different things, right? And that's, you know, what, what you have a happy memory about, somebody else may not. And so I just love keeping the dialogue open and again, not focusing on everything. I think there's another important step to this is you need to inform your family that you're doing this, have that open dialogue, but then do the work and check in with them only occasionally. The other mistake I see individuals make is 
for years, they may, every time they see their loved ones, they're talking about getting rid of stuff or they're sending stuff off with their kids or they're saying, Hey, do you want this? That is a constant reminder that mom and dad or grandpa and grandma or whatever aren't going to be here anymore. And I've, I noticed there's a lot of decision fatigue felt by both sides in that situation. There's also a lot of conflict that comes up because simply they're exhausted about talking about it, right? So I say, have the conversation up front, be really clear, and then do the work. And I, I love the fact that, yeah, your your stepdaughter forgot that she was getting these items and what a great treat, right? Um, it's and we not- did a call, uh, we did a video call with her. So she was opening them up you know, the box arrived and we said, do you want to just open it when it arrives or do you want us to be on a call with you? And she said, oh, why don't we do a call together? So that was really fun to then get that reaction as it was happening. So, and that's also the beauty of technology these days, right? We don't, you could have children, grandchildren that live all over the country, all over the world. You can still have these kinds of conversations that then ultimately help your stress. I mean, I will tell you, living through the experience, experience of clearing my mother's home, and I'm talking everything had to go, you know, right down to the countertops, the cupboards, the kitchen island, everything had to go because we were doing a major remodel. So finding the various aspects of who wanted or who would remove those pieces taught me a lot of lessons. And it also makes me not want to have to put anyone else through that. Yeah. And one of the I think biggest hurdles for people to start the process is they're worried about where the stuff is going to go. And I heard this wonderful quote once upon a time, this is not mine, so, (laughs) but I don't remember who said it. And they said, our things didn't have a perfect entrance to our lives. We don't need to find a perfect exit. And so often people just go, I want to make sure that it has a useful second life. I want to make sure somebody enjoys it. That's not your responsibility. The item was enjoyed. It was valued when it was there. It served its purpose. And you can be responsible. We can we can do the best we can to make sure that it's passed on. But so often we're kind of looking to unburden ourselves by burdening others. And so we do need to be careful about when we're going through a lot of different things, again, just to make sure that they're getting what they actually value and not what they feel guilty and, and like they're supposed to take. Amy, I wonder what your professional opinion is about this. I found when I was clearing a room or clearing a closet that if a friend was there with me, usually it was a girl for, <laughs> girlfriend that was not attached at all. Uh, but just if a friend was there with me, sometimes even if my husband was there with me, it got done more quickly and more efficiently because they're not as attached to each item like, oh, this wasn't their mother's stuff. And so they were just able to help me make more efficient decisions. Yeah, it's very helpful to have someone there. That is why a lot of professional organizers get hired to do clearouts um, because it's not our stuff, but we can be compassionate. We can hold space for our clients to know. Um, Sometimes having family there is actually tricky because it can slow down the process. I say memory lane is full of detours. So (laughs) that's the other problem about clearing out a space and doing this uh, death cleaning concept is you are going to come across a lot of memories, a lot of things that you forgot about. And so it's really important to when you come across that stumbling block or you find yourself really maybe slowing up and losing your motivation, setting aside those um those memories, those sentimental items, and just focusing on the nuts and bolts. The kitchen is a great place to start um, because there's generally not a lot of sentiment in the kitchen. Um, we know what all the tools are for. I mean, we it's a spoon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's spoon, a spoon. It's a plate. <laughs> um, but just recognizing when you're coming to that detour on memory lane and just to go, okay, it is not essential that we make a decision on this right now. There's other stuff that we can accomplish. Let's leave memory lane for a moment and wind down with the here and now, okay? Present the day road. (laughs) What's your best tip? Because you are a professional organizer after all. That's why you're one of our special contributors. What's your best tip for right-sizing in our current lives? Coming up with that intention, no matter what it is. So you don't have to be old and, and, and looking at death to set an intention, but to really understand why 
you want to declutter and why you want to organize, you have to know what you're making space for. And that doesn't mean a physical item to replace it, but you need to know why you're doing it. And it needs to be a positive reason. So often people want to declutter and get organized or become more productive or, you know, all these goals because they think that's what they should do or they think that's what other people want them to do. But really coming back with an intention for yourself. That's what I did when I downsized from 2,000 square feet to my tiny living in 180 square feet is I had an intention that I wanted to follow. So that makes it easier to let go. But I would say number two is really separating yourself from the stuff and knowing that the stuff you have gave you what it needed to give you, right? It doesn't need to provide more. You can let it go out into the world and let it serve someone else in whatever way that means. But really being at peace with that will help you let go of what you need to. Right. And I guess you're a great inspiration. If Amy can go from 2,000 square feet with her spouse, by the way, and more than 90% down to 180 square feet in an RV, I guess I should clear my office this coming week. So, (laughs) Amy Olson, thank you so much. For more great advice from Amy, go to lifedonesimply.com. Today's Crisis Brief brought to you by Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Number one, if you are clearing proactively rather than dealing with the loss of a loved one, set a clear intention for yourself. Why do you want to do this? And how might it help you in the future? Number two, talk to family and friends about what they value in your home. You will likely find the kids will take a pass on most of the things you've been saving for them all those years. Number three, use this as an opportunity to help a favorite charity. Also remember, not everything will find a perfect home and that's okay. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber is a proud sponsor of the Crisis Files podcast. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber is the area's most active business advocacy organization, playing a critical role in top issues impacting the region, including workforce development, education, housing, and transportation. Make your voice heard by becoming a member of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Learn more at mplschamber.com or Google Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Thank you to podcast producer Kim Inslee and audio engineer Tom Hamilton. Please rate and review The Crisis Files on your platform of choice. Check out our new website, thecrisisfiles.com, for fun facts about the show and all case files. Follow us on YouTube and Instagram at The Crisis Files. We do not provide legal, financial, medical, or PR advice for particular situations, but strongly recommend you seek out professionals for your specific need. I'm Roshini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files.